Good morning, and welcome to the latest installment in ICCT's webinar series. Today, a presentation on our ongoing project examining the fuel efficiency of U.S. airlines. I'm Joe Schultz, the Communications Director of the ICCT, and I'll be moderating today's webinar. Not doing very much. Just uh, In a moment, I'll turn this over to our presenter, Dan Rutherford, who is ICCT's Program Director for Aviation and Marine Transportation. He'll be joined by Irene Kwan, also of our aviation team, who's a co-author with Dan and some others of both the initial baseline study for this project, which was released late last year, and an update published just last month. Um, and we're also joined by Sarah Keller, uh, who is basically running the show here. Um, first, uh, some very brief housekeeping details. The presentation will last about half an hour. Afterward, we'll open the floor for questions and discussion. If you have questions, either during the presentation or afterward, please use the chat pane in your control panel to send them. Uh, Irene will be monitoring during the presentation, and she may be able to respond in some cases immediately. Otherwise, we'll queue up questions for the discussion afterward. Um, these are muted during the presentation, just to preserve audio quality and for other reasons. Uh, but if during the discussion you'd like to be unmuted to ask a question or make a comment, please just indicate that via the chat window or by clicking on the raised hand icon in the control panel, which uh, someone will see and we can unmute you then uh, and you can ask your question. Uh, lastly, just to note, the webinar is being recorded. Uh, we'll plan to post it on the ICCT.org as soon as possible, should be later today or sometime tomorrow. So with that, uh, let me turn this over to Dan. Thank you, Joe, for the introduction. Uh, as Joe had indicated, uh, my name is Dan Rutherford. I am the Program Director for Aviation and Marine at the ICCT. Uh, welcome to everyone uh, for uh, joining the webinar. Uh, before I jump into the work, I'd just like to uh, acknowledge the um, full team of researchers that worked on this project. Um, what I'll be walking you through today summarizes um, two full reports and also a number of um, blogs on our website uh, that uh, were put together by, a, by the full aviation team. Uh, that includes Irene Kwan, who's here with uh, us today, uh, Mazyar Zain Ali, and also Anastasia Karina. Uh, so uh, thanks to um, that full group for their uh, hard work on this project. I'd first like to start out by giving you some um, background on why we felt it was useful to do the study in the first place. That is why we uh, wanted to rank airlines based upon their fuel efficiency. Uh, I'll then talk a little bit about the study objectives uh, and uh, then what methodology by which we did the studies. Um, this will take a little bit of time as we, um, we, we did uh, take a um, somewhat uh, unusual approach to, com to um, comparing the various airlines' fuel efficiency. And uh, we'd like you to understand that uh, well before we jump into the findings. The findings uh, will be presented at several different levels, um, both looking at the individual performance of the airlines that are included in, this, in the, the survey, uh, but also in terms of the overall um, linkages between airline fuel efficiency and other variables like uh, technology, operational practices, and profitability. Before concluding, I'd then like to say a few words about a separate analysis that we included in our 2010 ranking, which looked at routes. Uh, so rather than comparison, comparing airlines across their full networks, we compared airlines across uh, specific routes in the U.S. domestic market. Um, and I'd like to say a few words about that. Uh, and then we'll provide some uh, simple conclusions uh, and take your questions as appropriate. So why did we feel it's uh, important or useful to rank airline fuel efficiency? Uh, as everyone on this call no doubt knows, uh, aircraft play a very important role in our transport system. Uh, they impact energy demand, both in the US and globally, uh, and they are an important contributor to climate change. About 5% of US GDP uh, in 2009 was linked with the aviation sector. 
Um, this translates to about 11% of energy-related carbon dioxide emissions uh, from U.S. transportation and about 4% of the total. Um, now, importantly, uh, globally, CO2 emissions from aviation uh, is increasing um, rapidly. Um, it's estimated that global CO2 emissions from uh, aviation may quadruple by mid-century relative to 2006 levels. So it's a rapidly growing source of emissions uh, and um, very much in the news today as the international community struggles with the question of how to constrain emissions growth. Um, furthermore, if you compare aircraft um, to other modes of transport uh, on comparable trips, you find, in fact, that planes are the most carbon-intensive way of traveling. Um, you see some sort of on-the-fly comparisons of, say, um, car efficiency on a commute uh, trip to uh, plane efficiency flying uh, transatlantic, uh, which is not necessarily a very helpful comparison. However, if you look at the um, trips in which planes actually compete with other modes, say 300 to 500 mile trips, uh, you in fact see that planes are the most carbon intensive way of getting around. Um, despite this fact, consumers, researchers, and policymakers have surprisingly little information about airline efficiency. And we felt it was useful to contribute to the state of knowledge on this. Finally, uh, as an environmental organization, uh, we feel there is value in recognizing uh, the top performers in the industry uh, and hopefully, hopefully contributing to a race to the top for the uh, ranked airlines. The next slide provides the overall study objectives. Um, we wanted to develop a robust and inclusive methodology that would allow for fair, equitable comparisons of fuel efficiency across airlines, irrespective of their size or business model. We'll jump back into this in a second uh, in describing how we uh, develop the study methodology. Um, our first uh, report uh, aimed to provide a snapshot U.S. domestic airline fuel efficiency for the base year of 2010. Um, and the subsequent updates provided a way to um, uh, develop trends over time. At this point, as Joe mentioned, we've done 2010 through 2012. Uh, we are um, developing and expecting to release uh, 2013 ranking as well sometime near the end of this year. Um, based upon that information, we wanted to look at the magnitude of fuel efficiency differences across the various carriers and also try to link those differences back to uh, key drivers such as the fuel efficiency of planes um, being operated by air. air so the, their operational practices, their profitability, et cetera. Uh, and finally, um, we wanted to develop a flexible, scalable approach uh, that could both be annually updated for the US, but also could be um, expanded to um, include international operations or um, assessments of other uh, markets worldwide. With that background, let's talk a little bit about the methodology. Um, we uh, developed the methodology for this study uh, in collaboration with um, researchers at the University of California's Ber Berkeley's uh, National Center of Excellence for Aviation Operations Research, or NEXTOR, which is an, uh, an FAA-funded um, research organization. Um, took us about, a, I think, a year and a half, I would say, to develop the methodology. Um, but uh, it was a very interesting um, process by which we, we learned a lot about um, uh, airlines, econometric models, and um, uh, a number of other issues. Um, the study covers U.S. domestic operations. We felt it was important to start there since the U.S. market is a very large aviation market and also the data available um, for this type of assessment is actually quite good. Um, the airlines um, uh, in the U.S. report um, fairly comprehensive data at, at mid to high levels uh, to the U.S. government, the Department of Transport. And so we, we decided to start really where the data is the best. 
Uh, we focused initially on 15 airlines in 2010, the, the major, what we call mainline airlines, um, plus 18 regional affiliates. Um, due to mergers between United Continental and Southwest AirTran, um, in 2012 we are now down to um, 13 mainline carriers. In total, we covered more than 99% of the U.S. domestic revenue passenger miles, or RPMs. Um, so we got pretty good coverage in the approach we took. Um, now the methodology that the overall methodology that we developed um, in collaboration with um, the UC Berkeley um, researchers uh, utilizes a frontier model approach. Uh, there's a schematic of kind of what the frontier model does uh, on the right hand of the slide. Uh, in essence, the approach um, ranks um, the efficiency of airlines relative to the best performing airline in a given uh, quarter. Um, so the, their quarterly reportings of fuel burn, uh, passenger miles, flights, a variety of other data by the airlines to a US DOT. Um, so it's a relative ranking. It's not, an, uh, it's not a, a ranking of how great airlines could be. It's uh, a question of you know, who is the best at a given point in time. Um, and in essence, you use a statistical model to develop a frontier of minimal fuel consumption based upon the transport service that a, um, an airline provides. And I'll unpack what transport service means in, in this context in a second. Uh, but what you can see from the diagram on the right shows is that each airline will provide a different level of transport service. And, the, and based upon how large the gap is between that airline's fuel consumption on the y-axis and the transport service they provide on the x-axis, um, they will be assigned a, a fuel efficiency score. So in this case, airline one is falling right on the frontier of minimal fuel use, so it's the most efficient. Airline two has uh, a small gap and would be the second most efficient. Three has a larger gap at third, and then N would be the most inefficient aircraft uh, airline. Uh, because it uh, deviates far from the frontier of minimum fuel use. Um, now, we um, normalize each airline's inefficiency value by the simple average and assign a fuel efficiency score. So in this case, a one is um, the, um, a one, 1 1.00 refers to the average airline in a year. A score greater than one is more efficient. A score less than one is less efficient. With that as background, the overall frontier approach, um, let me talk a little bit more about transport service and how we define it in this study. Um, a number of previous studies uh, have taken the approach of simply comparing airlines on the metric of fuel consumed per passenger mile uh, of transport provided. Uh, now for the reasons I'll, I'll discuss shortly, this in fact is not uh, a very good metric for fair comparisons across different airlines. Um, and it comes, comes down to the uh, fact that airlines provide more than just pure mobility to their passengers. They also provide access to their passengers uh, in the form of the number of flights. Now, uh, a greater number of flights trans, uh, translates either to serving more airports or providing more flight frequency between two given airports. And due to the flight physics in which uh, a large amount of fuel is, um, is consumed in takeoff, um, if uh, you look at an, two airlines, one which both provide the same number of passenger miles, but one serves more airports or has more flights, all other things being equal, that airline will burn more fuel. Now, uh, it's great if an airline is efficient at moving you, you know, from, uh, up, you know, airport one to airport two, uh, but if it also doesn't serve uh, other airports, um, it's, in essence, uh, the number of people who can enjoy that mobility is very limited. So, in our frontier approach, we develop a fuel efficiency frontier that is a function both of the mobility provided 
passenger miles provided, um, and also the access in terms of the, the number of um, flights provided. Um, and the diagram on the right side of this tries to sort of summarize this. Um, you can hypothetically look at two airlines, um, one which operates directly between San Francisco and New York, uh, and a second one in which um, stops over at Chicago uh, and therefore provides access to people in uh, based in Chicago either to uh, get on to the airline or to deplane from uh, deplane from the the flight. Um, so in, in this case, the diagram at the lower right shows that based upon the fuel efficiency, um, uh, you know, based upon this difference in the number of departures provided, the frontier approach will, in essence, benchmark the fuel efficiency of those two airlines at, to a different uh, area of the frontier curve. So the airline which provides more um, access for the same amount of mobility will in fact be given an additional fuel allowance. Um, it will be allowed to burn a little more fuel and, and than the airline which provides nonstop service. Um, so in essence, um, this approach develops a hybrid metric which allows for better comparisons across uh, airlines with diverse business models. A couple of um, other th uh, things we did in the study, um, we uh, took uh, pains to include affiliate uh, airline fuel use and transport service uh, to match them to the mainline carriers in order to provide the best comparison. Um, this ends up being fairly important because up to 23% of a mainline carrier's RPMs are in fact carried on regional affiliates. Um, furthermore, we developed a metric called circuity uh, which accounts for the degree to which airlines um, fly their passengers directly from their origin to their intended destination. Um, there ends up being about an 8% difference between um, the circuity of the carrier which provides the most direct service and a carrier which um, has a lot of uh, layovers which deviate from the great circle distance between airports. Do use primary is fuel use. So if you rely on models alone, you're limited by the inputs you have. Whereas if you use primary fuel burn data, anything an airline does to reduce fuel use is credited. Um, as I mentioned. Um, our methodology of, uh, uh, of airlines across different business models. Um, we also included regional affiliates and we rewarded airlines for operating more direct routes. With that background, let's jump into the study findings. Um, this slide summarizes the 2012 um, uh, ranking results. As I mentioned, there are 13 airlines uh, included in 2012. There are some ties, so you'll see that we have two airlines ranked uh, as 12th in, this, in the survey. Um, as I mentioned before, a score of 1.00 um, corresponds to the um, industry average for a given year. In this case, JetBlue Airways was the average airline in 2012, uh, whereas Alaska Airlines was, in essence, 13% um, better. better. and American Airlines was about a level. Um, there is also a vertical purple line in this case which designates where the industry average was in 2010. Uh, so you'll see that between 2010 and 2012, overall the industry improved about 2.3% in fuel burn, uh, uh, in fuel efficiency. Um, finally, at the far right hand side of the diagram, you'll see what the excess fuel burn per unit transport service is. Uh, in 2012, there was a 26% gap between the most efficient carrier, Alaska Airlines, and the least efficient carriers, Allegiant and American. This slide summarizes the relative rankings um, uh, across the, the three years of our study. Um, Alaska and Spirit were number one and two for all three years. 
uh, American and, Ale and Allegiant were the two least fit efficient carriers across all three years. There have been some movement uh, over time uh, within sort of the, the middle of the, the pack. Um, most importantly, there were two mergers, uh, Southwest Airtran and then Continental United. Uh, and um, in general terms, the Southwest Airtran merger, the resulting airline ended up being um, a little bit better than you would predict based upon the 2010 fuel efficiency scores of the individual airlines. Um, whereas the United Continental merger, um, the combined airline ended up being a little less efficient than you would predict just based upon the 2010 scores. Regarding our overall findings of relative airline performance, uh, I had mentioned most of these in the previous slide. We did find that uh, Alaska had the most fuel efficient U.S. domestic operations, followed closely by Spirit. Um, Alaska, we found, has very advanced technologies and fuel efficient aircraft, while Spirit in particular uh, has very efficient operational practices. We'll come back to this in a second. Uh, American Elite and Allegiant were the least fuel efficient air carriers through the full period of the study. Um, mergers had varying impacts on efficiency. Southwest Airlines had very strong fuel efficiency improvement over the full period of time, where the combined domestic operations of United and Continental were somewhat less efficient than would have been predicted based upon 2010 data. Um, overall, um, the gap remain steady over time and the fuel efficiency of U.S. domestic operations improved about 2.3 percent in total uh, between 2010 and 2012. Regarding the link between technology and operations, um, we, for the 2010 report we um, did a st an analysis of the linkage between the overall fuel efficiency of the airline and the underlying fuel efficiency of the aircraft it operates. Um, and the results of, of that analysis are shown in the right-hand uh, part of this slide. Um, I, I would um, invite you uh, to look back at the 2010 report for details. Um, overall, we found that the observed variance in uh, the fuel, fuel efficiency scores of airlines um, um, you know, about a third of it could be um, explained in terms of just pure technology alone. Um, in general, the more efficient airlines do fly newer and more fuel efficient aircraft. Uh, uh, and in fact, um, airlines which um, their regional carriers operate a large share of turboprop aircraft, in fact, uh, score better, as you might expect. Um, that being said, we did found, find that operational practices also influence the high-level airline fuel efficiency scores. Um, and a good example of this is Spirit Airways, which uh, operates its aircraft in a very fuel efficient manner. Um, profitability was uh, something we were interested in, um, given the, the uh, underlying argument that there's a natural driver for fuel efficiency in this sector due to high fuel prices. Um, what we found in our study is that the, the link between airline efficiency and profitability is actually fairly complex. Um, Alaska and Spirit uh, were our first and second most fuel efficient airlines. They were also the most profitable over the period of 2010 to 2012. However, there were some uh, laggards in efficiency that um, happened to be quite profitable as well. Um, Allegiant is uh, the clear example. Um, Delta Airlines, in fact, manages to be quite profitable um, operating um, a fairly fuel-intensive business model. Okay, um, before I jump into the overall conclusions, I just want to um, do a little bit of a plug for some other analysis that um, Irene and Corinne did in the 2010 report. Uh, in addition to the high-level fuel efficiency ranking, we also ranked um, U.S. airlines across the 10 um, most important U.S. routes. Uh, in this case, primary fuel burn data by flight is not reported by the airlines, so we modeled the results using um, as much BTS data as we could get and uh, an aircraft emissions model called Piano X. 
Um, in this case, um, we developed a, a more simple metric of passenger miles traveled per pound of fuel um, because of data limitations and also the assumption that that's the most useful metric for individual um, travelers. This slide shows the results of that analysis. Um, we, there are 10 separate tables in the appendix of the 2010 report. Uh, we did find that there was a, a, an even larger gap at the route level than at the overall airline level. Um, the, the difference between the most and least fuel efficient airline across a given route varied from as low as 9% to as high as 85%, depending upon the city-city pairs. Um, importantly, the top performing uh, aircraft airline at the, um, the 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 overall level did not necessarily uh, equate to being the top performing airline at a route level, um, and this is important because it suggests that route based or even flight specific data um, would be the ideal level of of data granularity. Uh, to enable low carbon purchasing decisions by consumers. All right. Um, so, what does all what does this all mean uh, to policymakers? Um, what we have found in this work is that the U.S. domestic efficiency improvements are in fact slowing over time. Um, U.S. airlines um, had a very strong track record of improving efficiency. Uh, on domestic operations, um, in particular between 1990 and 2008. Um, two important drivers of this uh, were um, improvements in load factor. Airlines were getting increasingly good at, um, and are getting increasingly good at um, filling their seats, which is a good thing. Um, there were also strong improvements in aircraft fuel efficiency during the 1980s. Uh, after which the fuel efficiency improvements of new aircraft started to tail off. Um, this is something that we identified um, uh, about five years ago in one of our first aviation studies. Um, and due to the time lag in the fuel, the fuel efficiency of new aircraft, sort of new designs, and how long it takes those aircraft to work their way through the full fleet, we are now seeing a slowdown of airline efficiency uh, today that is linked to the slowdown in new aircraft fuel efficiency um, after 1990. Um, the current rate of improvement is about 1.1% per year. Um, the comparison is a little bit tricky because um, in some cases the metrics vary. Um, but if you were to compare that to the stated climate protection goals that we see um, today, um, you know, for U.S. domestic operations, uh, the U.S. government assumed a 1.5 percent improvement in fuel efficiency in developing its uh, climate action plan. Um, ICAO currently has a 2 percent annual fuel efficiency aspirational goal for international aviation. Um, so if you compare the current trends and, in particular, the slowing down over time, um, we, we conclude that the current rates of improvements are not sufficient to um, meet long-term climate protection goals. Um, what this indicates to us is the need for policies to promote and boost aviation efficiency. Uh, two of the most important today are um, a CO2 standard that ICAO was developing that uh, could accelerate the rate of fuel efficiency improvements for new aircraft. Um, ICAO, the uh, International Civil Aviation Organization, is also developing market-based measures uh, that could promote in-use efficiency. Uh, conclusions, uh, you can see. Um, there are five main conclusions from this work. Uh, we have found a large and uh, stable fuel efficiency gap across various airlines. Uh, about 26% overall and up to 85% on specific routes. We have found that both technology, the underlying fuel efficiency of the aircraft, and operational practices uh, distinguish the best airlines from the worst airlines in fuel efficiency terms. 
uh, we found a poor correlation between profitability and fuel efficiency, um, despite um, the current historically high fuel prices. Uh, and we found a rate of uh, a falling rate of fuel efficiency improvement um, that is uh, now short of domestic and international climate protection goals. Um, finally, this sort of relates to the overall objectives of the study. Um, we do think that there's value in providing consumers, investors, and policymakers with more transparent and comprehensive data to enable um, informed choices. Um, we've done our part to contribute uh, that data, but we do think there is more to be done. Uh, and we, um, we hope that, uh, that this study has contributed to the discussion and can lead potentially to uh, better data provisions. I will now turn uh, back to uh, Joe to see if um, there are any questions we can answer. Uh, thanks, Dan. Sounds like we have an interesting question to answer and there ourselves. But um, anyway, thanks for an interesting presentation. Uh, and we do have a, some questions queued up, so let me just jump into that. Hope that we can keep your slides going. The first one uh, has to do with um, what your plans are. I think you alluded to this uh, briefly in some of your discussion, but uh, specifically, what other rankings do, does the aviation team have planned or underway for different regions of the world or globally? Uh, and in particular, um, do you have anything planned for Europe or the Gulf carriers? Great, thanks. Uh, great question. Um, as I indicated, we um, started where the data availability was um, the strongest um, in the U.S. market. Um, we do hope that we can expand the work and it, the frontier approach we've developed uh, should be flexible enough to cover different markets. Um, the logical next step for us is to look at um, international routes for U.S. airlines since uh, U.S. carriers do report um, data to the Department of Transportation on their international routes. Um, that's a logical next step. Um, there are some complications in we likely will need to develop a uh, new metric um, using the frontier approach to take into account um, uh, cargo. Um, I think Europe is a market we're also very interested in. Um, there is potentially we're still looking into data availability, but um, the the work that uh, the EU did on its emissions trading scheme and market-based measures uh, may be unlocking some data that could provide the basis for um, uh, an EU-based ranking. Um, Gulf states would be really interesting to do. I honestly have no clue as to what data is currently available. Um, but, uh, you know, provided we have data and um, sufficient resources um, to work on this, I think the, the methodology could be done at a variety of different levels and di for different markets. Here's a question that goes back to the distinction you made uh, relatively early in the presentation about access. Uh, and the question is, do you give credit to airlines that serve uh, airports that other airlines don't when you're doing uh, in that part of the analysis? Um, we don't go to the level of individual airlines, uh, sorry, individual airports, um, except for the route-based analysis um, in which uh, uh, we might go down a rabbit hole with if I talk too much about the route-based analysis. But for the um, top-level sort of main, main airline ranking, um, we don't drill down to who provides you know, access to which individual airports. Um, rather, we use, in the same way that passenger miles is used as a proxy for mobility, we use just the, the pure number of flights provided as a proxy for the access. Um, and so, you know, for a given number of airports, increasing flights would increase the flight frequency, 
so passengers would have to wait less to get on a plane. Uh, for a given flight frequency, increasing the number of flights would allow you to serve a greater number of airports. Um, so um, I think the answer is, you know, we don't drill down to trying to credit airlines for serving, for example, the Fargo airport well. Um, rather, um, just overall, we credit them for the overall access they provide. There's a question uh, on a different line. Uh, is the energy content of the jet fuel used by different airlines equivalent? <laughs> oh, that is a great question. Um, there certainly are specifications for um, jet fuel quality. Um, off the top of my head, I do not know how much variation you would get in energy content um, within those specifications, nor do we have any data about how that would vary across individual airlines. Um, I, I think the first question is answerable, and maybe we, w the aviation team can take that offline and, um, and reach out to the questioner later. But at the moment, we, we can't really answer that. Got it. Okay. Interesting, though, because it sounds like uh, that could potentially have some effects, maybe at the margins, on uh, on how you would evaluate the energy efficiency of a given airline against either within itself or against another. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, at the margins, potentially it could. Um, we we did we did think uh, a fair amount about the underlying uncertainty of this methodology when we um, put develop the rankings and thus um, sort of why you see ties, for example. Um, but the, yeah, the, at, at the margins there are some some interesting little effects that at the moment we, we can't account for. Okay. Um, here is a question uh, that I know we discussed quite a bit in uh, at various times in, uh, in sort of publicizing the reports. Um, Delta bought very old aircraft a few years ago, McDonnell Douglas. How did that affect their overall fuel efficiency? And maybe you'd like to take the opportunity to talk a little bit about um, uh, that as a contributing factor and one of the ways that, air that airlines are affecting their energy use, fuel use. Sure, sure. Um, great question. Uh, and in fact, the um, Poor performance uh, in fuel efficiency terms of both Allegiant and American. Uh, Allegiant, in particular, is due to this MD80 effect, in that they they are operating fleets that are heavily re reliant upon older McDonnell Douglas aircraft. Um, Delta has been, um, you know, purchasing some of these aircraft uh, and. Um, as other airlines sort of are shedding them uh, due to uh, high fuel costs among other issues. Um, I don't know that we can um, empirically say today of, of how much of an impact that has had on Delta's overall fuel efficiency score, um, but it does speak to sort of this question about fuel intensive yet profitable business models um, because Allegiant is in essence um, uh, has, a, has a, a business model which takes advantage of the fact that um, used equipment is um, can be bought very cheaply today uh, and they've sort of designed their business model around that and have happened to be uh, quite profitable. Um, it looks like Delta has sort of Taking, taking, you know, some stimulus off of that, and uh, is um, in some ways pursuing the same approach. That is, purchasing used equipment at very low costs. Um, so you have low fixed costs. Um, you have higher um, operational costs due to the the more fuel intensity uh, of those aircraft, but in the net has ended up being rather profitable. Um, so um, clearly it's it's an important variable um, and it's something that we are looking at because 
it, it sort of draws into question this the, the the argument that fuel price alone is is going to be sufficient to continue to drive efficiency improvements in the sector. Okay, good. Uh, one more, it looks like. Um, Aviation Week just released a, a, its own airline ranking based on profitability a few year, a few days ago. Apparently, uh, I hadn't seen that. Uh, do you find the results consistent with your study? Can you say a few words about it? Have, are, is this a coming as? I hope we're not springing a surprise on you, but. Uh, no, no, not at all. Um, in fact, we we did catch that ranking, and um, uh, we were discussing whether we should um, blog about it. Um, it, the, the results are actually um, quite consistent with our ranking. It's, it's. I, I suspect it's using exactly the same data source, so it's it's kind of silly to say it's consistent. Um, I mean, we're we're both using. Um, I expect uh, Department of Transportation data for that. So, yeah, their ranking on profitability is very consistent with our work. Um, and uh, there are a variety of rankings uh, out there. Ours is focused narrowly on fuel efficiency, but there are profitability rankings, there are uh, consumer satisfaction rankings, uh, there are um, uh, on-time performance rankings, everything. Um, so we, we recognize we're sort of a drop in the bucket, but hopefully our ranking is providing some added value. Uh, good. Well, that actually uh, about does it for the questions, I think, unless um Anyone else in the audience has any more to add? Doesn't seem like they do. Uh, so we're just a couple minutes early, but um, it seems like we've come to a good stopping place. Unless Dan, you have some final concluding thoughts? No, uh, nothing on my end. Here's another question. One more. Uh, uh, and it's a good one, actually. Did you take into account cargo carried in your analysis? Yes. So um, this was a subject of much discussion um, when we were originally developing our methodology. Um, cargo aircraft obviously do move both passengers and cargo. Um, so you know, the, there there was um, a thought that rather than passenger miles ton miles would be an appropriate metric. Uh, in looking at specifically at the U.S. domestic market, um, the uh, researchers at, U at UC Berkeley concluded um, for the U.S. market that cargo carried uh, was small enough and did not vary across carriers enough uh, to make a significant difference in the rankings. Uh, if I recall correctly, the average, if you if you uh, convert passengers carried and um, sort of their luggage, et cetera, to a mass, and then compare that mass to the cargo carried on U.S. domestic operations, um, overall cargo only accounted for about three percent of the total mass moved within U.S. domestic operations. For that reason. Um, in, in we do not account for cargo in this methodology. Moving forward, if we look at other markets, in particular international routes, cargo will become much more important, and so we'll need to take that into account in future rankings. Let me just, on behalf of the ICCT, thank everyone who uh, attended the webinar. Uh, remind you that we will, um, at least we will plan to make the recording available on, on our website. Uh, I guess we'll see how chopped up it got by the technical difficulties with moving the slides. Um, and I think that the aviation team may be following up with some of the questioners uh, individually. Uh, and that's it. Thanks again for coming. Uh, please stay tuned. Uh, there, as Dan mentioned, there is uh, more work coming out of this project uh, planned for later in the year, and uh, there will be another webinar out of that. Uh, and so stay tuned. Thanks, Dan. Thanks, uh, Irene and Sarah. And uh, thanks to the attendees.